This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, a very special welcome to Congressman Rob Whitman, 1st Congressional District, having served here in the House of Delegates for a couple of years, back 2006, 2007, then after the untimely death of Joanne Davis, elected a special election. In fact, we were seeing that you were elected to the House for your second term in November, then in December of that year, elected to your first year in Congress, and you've been reelected six times since then, I believe. That's and correct. I was noticing too, Congressman, that one of your issues in 2006 and seven was high-speed internet. Yes. And I do believe it's one of your issues still today, as it is the issue of the General Assembly, to try to get high-speed internet to the unserved areas. It's extraordinarily important. In fact, today in my office in Mechanicsville, we were meeting with constituents, and the big issue that they came before us with was as businesses and uh -huh. as uh, individuals, one that was a doctor that recently moved to the area, is a frustration with not having high-speed internet access. So we're working with all the different entities out there. As you know, the Virginia General Assembly has put additional money into the Virginia yes. Telecation, Telecommunications Initiative, better known as VADI. In the recent appropriations bill passed out of Congress, we put $660 million into the rural broadband account to help build out rural broadband. Uh, I've been an advocate to make sure that it's public-private partnerships that are the projects that we prioritize because I think leveraging those public dollars with private dollars is the key to do that. So I, I feel uh, cautiously optimistic about great, getting great. things really kicked off and getting uh, those things in the, going in that direction. And they're really important for local economies, for businesses to not only locate there but to grow. It's important for our students because when they have a, a tablet computer that the school system purchases for them and they can't do their homework online at home, mom or dad has to put them in the vehicle and go to the library or go to the McDonald's right, to get right. Wi-Fi. And then access to health care in rural areas. Really telemedicine is an exciting part of that to have specialist access patients in rural areas and broadband is the key for us to be able to have access and affordability in healthcare in rural areas. Yeah, one of your major committee, maybe the major one, is the Armed Services Committee. You've been on that, working on that, and part of your initiative is working on rebuilding the military. Tell us something about that. Absolutely. Well, our committee is focused on the Navy, Marine Corps, and the Air Force, and specifically on the Navy side is to rebuild our Navy to modernize it. Today we're just a little over 280 ships. We need to be at about 355 ships. Uh, that's key and not only building those additional ships but building the right kinds of ships. Recently the Navy just signed a contract with Huntington Ingalls Industries, better known as Newport News Shipbuilding, yes. to build two aircraft carriers at a time which actually allows us to save four billion dollars. So I was very proud of our initiative in the subcommittee that I chaired where I am now the ranking member in the effort to, to get that done. Also, the 
Shipyard there is going to be building the new nuclear submarine, the Columbia class submarine. So exciting things going on, but we have lots of catch up to do to make sure we have a Navy that can can rival the other navies around the world. And we need to make sure that we are there as a deterrent to the Russians, to the Chinese, to even to the North Koreans and to the Iranians and others that look to uh, to contest the United States and look even to be aggressive with our with our allies. And how do we how do we do that? We do that through naval presence around the world. So if people are aligned with making sure we rebuild our Navy. Obviously, Virginia is going to be an important part of that, as well as shipyards around the United States. But we want to make sure that our sailors and Marines have what they need when we ask them to go into harm's way. And I argue that a strong Navy, a strong naval presence around the world is the greatest deterrence to aggression uh, that the world can have. Yes. So a safe world is dependent upon a strong United States Navy. You know, one of the other issues I see that you're working on, and they're working on the General Assembly here too, is the CTE STEM work that's yes. so critical. Well, it was great. We just uh, we just met today with a, uh, a CTE program in New Kent County called Bridging Communities, where yes. they're reaching out and bringing students in from high schools uh, through the community college there, Rapid Community College, which has their campus there, as well as having adult education. If you look at where we are going in the future, you see that 60% uh, plus of the new jobs out there are not going to require a four-year degree, but they will require a certification or credential. In fact, over a lifetime, folks in the career and technical education area, whatever it may be, heating and air conditioning, electrical work, uh, network engineering, all those things, you can actually make more over a lifetime than you can in some four-year degree program. So we right. want to make sure that we're emphasizing the right efforts there, and CTE is a critical part of that. It really is the conduit for success for our students, and we want to make sure parents understand that their students, their children, don't necessarily have to go to college and get a four-year degree in order to be successful in life, and we want to make sure we have equal emphasis to college track efforts in our middle schools and high schools versus the career and technical education track because we want to make sure we're charting student success and it's not on a single path it's on multiple paths and career and technical education is an important part of that. But you, know, you know the Commonwealth of Virginia and, and you know too from your colleagues in Washington there's a great deal of emphasis on infrastructure yes. needs. And what do you see, what are some of your goals for the 116th Congress? Well, I think obviously for Virginia, transportation is the key. If you look at the I-64 corridor, some great construction taking on yes. there. If you look at the improvements that are going to happen on the I-95 corridor from the 610 Aquai Garrisonville exit down to the Route 3 exit and expanding lanes there. But there's more that needs to be done. So it's not just transportation, but it's also mm -hmm. broadband. That's infrastructure for our nation, so building out the right. broadband system. And also for Virginia, our port. Our Virginia port is one of the most uh, opportunity, uh, great, greatest opportunities we have uh, to grow uh, our economy. So we want to make sure, too, that the dollars are there to deepen the channel, which is a project that's underway. So making sure we look at our port, look at broadband, look at our roads are all part of infrastructure that has to be part of whatever bill comes out of Congress. And I'm cautiously optimistic that that's a place where we can find bipartisan support and actually get some things done. Uh, governmental accountability. I know that people talk about it, but, uh, but you're working on we're doing something to increase governmental accountability. What are some initiatives you see that you're going to be undertaking on that? Well, you know, I, when you talk about process, it's not something that immediately comes to people's mind yes. as far as the legislature. But I think the process in Washington is broken. And there are three elements that I think we can do to fix that so that members of Congress are the ones that suffer the consequences if they don't get the job done. The first of those is a bill I've been working on now for over five years called No Budget, No Pay. Pretty simple. If you don't get a budget done by April 15th, you don't get a paycheck. Here in the General Assembly, they're required by statute to have a budget done before the end of the, of the fiscal year. Uh, in Washington, uh, not so much. We end up with these continuing resolutions and a kicking of the can down the road. We saw ourselves in a shutdown situation this year that was entirely avoidable. So no budget, no pay is something I hope will come before the Congress. Secondly, it's called the Stay on Schedule Act. Congress has this mm. archaic practice of August recess, which many members use as vacation. I don't think any member gets to go home at the end of July 
into August until all 12 appropriations bills are done out of the House. If you get your work done, you can go home, you can vacation, but if you don't, you stay in Washington until it's done. The Senate was required to stay in town this year, and they actually got their appropriations bills done. I urged the Speaker to do the same. Unfortunately, he didn't. This legislation would make that happen. And lastly, when we get to the end of the federal fiscal year, September 30th, if there is not an appropriation bill that either passes or a continuing resolution that passes out of the House, then the roles are reversed. Federal government employees continue to get paid, but members of Congress do not. So we're going to put members of Congress pay on the line. So if they allow a shutdown, it's members of Congress that don't get paid. We're not going to hold the federal workforce hostage to inaction by the Congress. So, and this is a bill that's called Inaction Has Consequences and for members of Congress. So those are process bills that I think are important for Congress to send the message that if it doesn't get the job done, it's members of Congress that suffer because right now that's not what happens. Members of Congress can kick the can down the road, can point the finger at somebody else and say, well, it's their fault, that body's fault, this group's fault, instead of saying no. It's each individual members of Congress responsibility to get the job done. And if we don't, we ought to be the ones that suffer the consequences. We applaud you on that effort. And, and our viewers will know if they don't live in the first congressional district, they live in one of the 11 congressional right. districts. And, and we should have all 11 of the members in Virginia signing on and supporting that. I and, agree. and hopefully people around, around the country. It makes sense. It does. I noticed that you have an excellent website by the way. Yes, I, and I you. noticed on that that you have another issue related to this that has to do with that automatic increase, cost of living increase issue that that you don't have to vote on to get. And I think if I read it correctly, you were saying that you should have to vote to get that instead That's of right. just letting it come out automatically. That's right. Well, I think several things have to happen. First of all is you cannot have automatic increases to the federal debt ceiling. Yes. There's an effort to do that right now. I think that needs to be debated because our debt is getting is past an unsustainable level. We're on track to get to $22 trillion. I think Congress needs to debate that to determine what are we going to do to manage both the deficit and the debt. As you know, members of Congress don't get automatic pay raises, but I think, too, if that's ever considered, it absolutely has to be part of the debate. And another element of reform that I put in is members of Congress, many of, many of whom travel back and forth by airlines, should not be allowed to travel first class. So if you travel on mm -hmm. the government dime, you should have to do it just like other federal employees. You travel in coach. Uh, if you're a member of the military and you're going to your duty station overseas, you don't get to fly in business class or first class. You fly in coach. In every instance where I have traveled, I travel just like a member of the military. We travel in coach, and I think that's the way members of Congress ought to be required to travel uh, because it's only fair that they are just like any other federal employee. They shouldn't be treated differently they should be required to do the same as our federal workforce and our brave men and women in the military. Now, the Natural Resources Committee is another committee that you serve on, and certainly the importance of the Chesapeake Bay and everything pertaining to that. What do you see as some of the key initiatives that you or your colleagues will be making in that committee? Well, the key right now is to make sure we continue to fund the Chesapeake Bay program, which is the program that requires all states to work together to continue to clean up the bay. And it is indeed a federal function because Virginia can't force Pennsylvania to do anything. But under the Clean Water Act, the federal government can require that they comply with the federal regulations to clean up uh, the Susquehanna, which is the main contributor of nutrients to the bay. So I think that's extraordinarily important to make sure we have the resources there. I worked together with members of the Virginia delegation, including Senator Warner, who helped on the Senate side in getting the Chesapeake Bay Accountability and Recovery Act passed several years ago and signed into law by President Obama. And it simply says this, now we identify exactly where every penny on the Chesapeake Bay is being spent at the local, state, and federal level so we know where's the money going. And then we have an independent evaluator, somebody different from the federal agencies that manage these programs to evaluate and say, are these programs working? And if they are, how do we repeat that success? And if they're not working, how do we stop doing the things that aren't working and redirect resources to things that are working? So it's been very successful, and I think it's a concept that Senator Warner and I believe can be translated to other areas of government management because we want to make sure there's transparency and accountability. And how better to do that than to, to reveal exactly where every penny's being spent and then have somebody separate from the government 
to evaluate these and say, is this successful or not? And if so, why? So we keep doing the things that are successful, and if not, why also, and let's not do those things that are not successful. Before the 116th began, Senator Kane was here as our guest, and mm -hmm. we were talking, we, I think we concluded the conversation talking about how the Virginia delegation across party lines throughout the regions of the 11 districts and the two senators really meets together and finds the common ground issues. I asked the senator then, and I would ask you now, you've had five new members yes. join, join, and so, uh, is that working? Are you still finding that time to try to get together as a Virginia delegation? We are. We've actually had two lunches since oh. the new 116th oh, already. Congress has, already. has been seated. So we have one each month. And uh, I think all of the members have attended those, all the new members. Uh, we had great conversations, kind of getting to know each other, talking about Virginia issues. And obviously, those of us that have been there for a while try to lay the groundwork so we understand the things that the members of the congressional delegation are working on, where we're working in Virginia's interests, where we can work together on things. And listen, we'll have some political differences, oh, but yes. the good thing in right. Virginia is that, you know, we always put Virginia first and we are cognizant of the fact that we have to work with each other. And listen, uh, there's, you know, there are times when we can have differences on policy, but just the ability to sit down at a lunch together and talk about these things creates the civility that I think in many instances yes. is lacking in other areas of government. So Virginia leads the way because there are other state delegations that can't even get in the same That's room That's what together. I understand. Is they don't, don't do that. So hats off to, to you and all your colleagues. Congressman Whitman, we thank you so much for you. being here with us in this week in Richmond and we thank look you. forward to talking with you again. We'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. Delighted to welcome Jeff Shapiro, Craig Carper back. It's been a while since I've had the two of you on together. Folks know you from the Richmond Times Dispatch, WCVE Radio, the programs that you do together. And if I talked about all of your many credits, it'd be giving me notice that the time is up. So in the next eight to nine minutes, I'm really interested in having you all inform our viewers about bills among the 600 or so that uh, on March 7, that's when we're having the conversation, May st still before the governor that he hasn't really acted on and our viewers if they watch the calendar know the governor has until midnight on the 26th of this month to to act and so hop right in and what sure. whether it's the budget bill or other bills that you'd want to talk about uh, well certainly the budget yes. and uh, you know as Greg and I have discussed on our Friday morning uh, visits on WCVE radio <laughs> Tune in at what time? Uh, 8.45 yeah, exactly. on WCVE News, 88.9 yeah. FM, or live stream. Uh, yeah. um, Idea stations, Dr. <laughs> but what has distinguished that budget is what's not in it. Uh, and there would have been another billion dollars or so yes. uh, were the um, uh, governor not to have gone along with uh, this very seemingly very generous tax credit, tax give back, tax cut that the Republicans pushed. Uh, had there been that other $932 million, I believe mm -hmm. that's the uh, figure, there might have been even, you know, more money for the uh, the goodies that uh, that governors and legislators, particularly in an election year, um, like. Nonetheless, there's still a good deal of money in there uh, for, uh, shall we say, voter-sensitive uh, programs, teacher salaries, um, school counselors, that's not as generous an investment as the governor would like, and, and, but it's one that is significant largely because this is something the administration believes is essential to improving school safety. Mm -hmm. That if there are more counselors mindful of more students, that there is a greater potential to minimize, if not avert, some of these violent right, and eruptions, and gun yeah. violent and, eruptions. And that select the committee that the speaker appointed was all on board on that issue uh, as well. Yes, but that select committee that the speaker appointed uh, looked at everything but gun control. Yes. Uh, and maybe that's a bow, is a, certainly a presumed bow to the uh, firearms lobby, yeah. Republican-friendly firearms lobby. 
Craig and I were talking before you, you, you arrived to, for the show that two years ago the governor just signed the budget as it was. So are you thinking there might be amendments or things changing in the budget? Well, typically there are amendments. The question I think that we're all wondering about is how uh, active the governor is going to be in the next few weeks uh, that he's got to make adjustments. Uh, you know, typically <coughs> you see uh, Governors making you know a bunch of uh, line item uh, adjustments to the budgets, either vetoes or uh, adding language back in that they had introduced in December that the legislature struck uh, out. Uh, but we're wondering now, you know, in this new strange reality that we're all living in uh, post scandal, uh, what that does to the governor's uh, strategy. Uh, it's it's. Obvious that he's got less uh, polit uh, political momentum or political capital to spend. Um, so he, I would say he's unlikely to go too far out on a limb with either adjustments to the budget or legislation. Uh, but I would assume he would do he would take some actions. The things that I would anticipate would be that he would be uh, trying to uh, earn capital with. Uh, the groups that he has disappointed in this scandal, and most namely uh, the Black Caucus. Uh, anything I think that you could uh, say dealt with uh, racial equity, to uh, come up with an example, um, the uh, at-risk add-on for uh, schools, uh, the areas where um, you've got high concentrations of poverty, right. typically minority communities. That was something that uh, the caucus was vocal about during the session. It could be that uh, the governor tries to put a little bit more money in there for something like that or other programs that uh, disproportionately affect people on the lower rungs of the socioeconomic scale, many of the minorities. Yeah, and procedurally there are a couple of things to keep in mind. I'm recognizing, of course, that the, the, the governor's leverage would appear somewhat diminished because of this calamity. Um, there are uh, only narrow Republican majorities in the House and the Senate, so that means the governor can probably confidently use his veto to strike individual items that he deems offensive, uh, that the Republicans could not o override them. Uh, that said, um, the, the, the idea of an amendment, a tweak, some revision requiring a simple majority, depending on the, the item uh, the governor has in mind, uh, it may be more regional in its application than, than partisan, and that might scramble some of the, um, uh, the arithmetic mm -hmm. on, a, on an up or down floor right. vote. Finally, and this is, I think is more significant, um, next year in January, actually it'll be the end of this year in December, formally that is, the governor will introduce the only two-year budget of his term that is really his and his alone, and, and that will be the, the fiscal foundation of, of his legacy. Now, how robust that legacy mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, of course, depends on what happens in these legislative elections. As a note, getting back to your original question, yes. David, uh, we, at the time of this taping, just shortly before this taping, uh, we were looking at the uh, most recent data that we had on actions taken by the governor, and we noticed there was only one uh, bill that he had amended. And that it, see, it was a seemingly non-controversial sure. bill. This was right. it had to deal with religious exemption, a special photo ID, or a special photoless ID for uh, people who had strongly held religious beliefs that um, mm -hmm. prohibited them from taking a photo. I didn't even get to read the amendment, uh, but I'm, you know, I think it's telling that usually we're mm -hmm. seeing more amendments at this stage in the process. What other bills in the last minute and a half or so? Any other bills? The budget, obviously, the big one. But any other bill that pops out in your mind that be one that you're wondering at this point on 7th of March, what's the governor going to do with this bill? Well, also keep in mind some of the bills that he's signed and the conditions under which he signed them. So one of the bills that he had to act on almost immediately because the legislature was still in session was increasing the, uh, the age to... Uh, procure tobacco right. products from right. 18 to 21. Uh, we've all been here uh, a long time. We know uh, tobacco is a historic product, um, uh, that it is uh, considered sacred despite uh, the fact that it is uh, not contributing as much cash to the economy as it, as it once did. Governor 
signed that bill very quickly, uh, very quietly, and it was a bill in which the tobacco industry had a big, big hand uh, in, in shaping. The other one is essentially to you know, establish public schools in Virginia as universally wall-to-wall -wall tobacco free. And I'm getting a signal that our time is up, but stay right where you are because in our last few seconds, we want to have a short tribute to Betsy Stark Barton, who really was Miss Mrs. Civics Education in the Commonwealth of Virginia, along with her husband Jonathan, really pushed for recognition of the tribes. First day of March, a bright light went out in Richmond and around the state. Long-term employee for the Department of Education and legislators were calling and checking who were on the civics commission over the years because they had worked with with Betsy over that time so we we pause at the end to uh, remember her and her legacy here in the Commonwealth so thank you both this week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association an investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Health Care Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.